Okay, this lecture is going to go over porphyria. Primarily, I'm going to look at what it actually means, the biochemistry behind porphyria, and how it's classified. I'm not going to go very deep into the clinical presentation, however. Porphyria comes from the Greek word uh, porphyra, and uh, the, the word means purple. And the reason is because um, people with porphyria tend to have a discoloration in the urine or in the feces, or in both, and uh, that can be shades of red all the way up to purple. We're going to discuss exactly why that is going into the organic chemistry of it. So this is what I just said. With porphyria, you have um, changes in the color of the feces and the urine when it's exposed to light. So porphyria is simply, it's a biochemical disease, and it's associated with the production of porphyrin. So what is porphyrin? Porphyrin, if you remember um, lectures and stuff on hemoglobin, porphyrin is one of the essential ingredients of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, or H HBG, is essentially heme, a heme plus a globin chain. And um, so what is he uh, porphyrin is used to make up heme. So heme is simply, uh, so we put heme is simply iron in the 2 plus state plus uh, protoporphyrin. Protoporphyrin. So you can see from the name that protoporphyrin is a porphyrin. Now the other important thing to note is that uh, the disease can either be inherited or, inqu or acquired. So you can have a mutation in any of eight different enzymes, or you can have a toxin that upregulates those enzymes. So porphyria is a condition where enzymes get upregulated. So it's it's different than most of the types of uh, uh, genetic z diseases that you'll see because a lot of genetic diseases when there's a mutation an enzyme gets downregulated or it becomes non-functioning however in this disease you get an overactive enzyme either because its, uh, it's uh, rate limiting step is increased or because it's being activated or transcribed when it shouldn't be so for example the enzyme uh, ALAS which is the first enzyme in the step for production of porphyrin, protoporphyrin, uh, if it were somehow, uh, if that enzyme were to be transcribed too many times, then you would have an upregulation of protoporphyrin. Now I point out here specifically that drugs and toxins and environmental causes can also uh, be behind porphyria, and that's because um, cytochrome P450 is uh, it actually uses porphyrin in the liver uh, as part of its uh, makeup, and um, so this uh, this is the major enzyme used to detoxify drugs and toxins and other environmental things. So let's do a little, really quick, some organic chemistry on this. Now, uh, this molecule on the left is called a porphyrin, and porphyrins are basically substituted porphyrins. So if we talk about porphyrins, it's easier to talk about the guy on the left because there's less going on than the guy on the right. This here is heme uh, B, and so if you see the, the iron in the middle, um, if you took the iron out, that would simply be protoporphyrin. So let's look really quickly at porphyrin. The first thing that you'll see is we have a double bond, no double bond, double bond, no double bond, double bond. Now, so if you remember back in organic chemistry, when you have a pattern like this, that is called conjugation. So this molecule is completely, uh, highly conjugated, completely conjugated. And if you follow Huckel's rule, if you remember the 4n plus 2 rule on conjugation, uh, you, when you're counting the pi electrons, if there are 4n plus 2 pi electrons, that makes it an aromatic compound. So aromatic compounds, they're, they're great be, uh, because they require a lower energy state. So lower energy. And when something's lower energy, it's more stable. So that's just uh, bring you back to the uh, organic chemistry. But the reason why this is really cool is because all these conjugated things, uh, when you have this many conjugation, conjugated pi electrons, you start to absorb light in the visible spectrum. 
So if you're absorbing light in the visible spectrum, then you're going to have color changes. So that's where we get the the concept with that whenever this is urinated out or, or excreted out in the feces, you get um, ch color changes from uh, reds to purples. So let's take a look through my microscope and see exactly how heme is uh, made biochemically. So we're going to zoom in to high power and what I've done here is I've tried to separate the first step from the last step because the first step takes place inside of the mitochondria. So this is the mitochondria and then out here is the cytoplasm. And the first step and the last few steps all take place in the mitochondria while all the intermediate steps take place in the cytoplasm. So what happens, you have succinyl-CoA and glycine and they uh, through the process of its uh, amino levulinic acid synthase or ALAS and this is the committed step and also uh, the rate limiting step so through uh, ALAS, succinyl-CoA and glycine are um, combined to form amino levulinic acid. Now remember I said that Hemoglobin is simply heme plus globin, and so what we're doing is we're going through the this pathway to form heme, and if anything slows this down, we will get less hemoglobin, and so anything that would slow this process down would cause an anemia. Now specifically in sideroblastic anemia, the enzyme aminolevulinic acid synthase, or LAS, is either deficient or is uh, acting or downregulated somehow, and so you get less production of heme, and this will cause a sideroblastic anemia through the, the, product, the, the reduced production of porphyrin, or specifically protoporphyrin. So anything in this pathway that would reduce the production of heme uh, typically is going to uh, result in, a, in a, an anemia, and the first two uh, specifically, uh, alas and alad, will result in sideroblastic anemias. Anything that increases this process will result in a porphyria. So once uh, these are combined to form aminolevulinic acid, they are acted upon by alad, which is aminolevulinic acid dihydratase. And aminolevulinic acid dehydratase, or alad, forms PBG or prophobilinogen. So we get um, from alas, we can get X linked, let me write this in, we can get X linked sideroblastic anemia. And alad, the, um, the heavy metal lead, acts on it to produce a lead induced sideroblastic anemia. But let me back up really quick. So we started with alas. And alas, I, I haven't mentioned yet, but there are two uh, there are two genes in our body that both produce alas. Now one of those genes is expressed primarily in the bone marrow and that would be alas2 or ALAS2 and alas1 is uh, primarily produced in the liver and in other tissues. So with alas1 there is no known mutation but whenever you have um, exacerbations of acute hepatic porphyria uh, that's that's caused by alas1 but uh, it's not due to a gene mutation it's usually due to some other upregulation of the of uh, an, a, an upstream biochemical um, uh, regulator. And deficiency in ALAS2 typically result in something called X-linked, let me write this out, X-linked, it's, it's called XLP, X-linked por, uh, protoporphyria, so XLP is, is associated with upregulation of ALAS2 in the erythrocytes. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go ahead and finish the pathway and then I'll talk about all of the other um, different porphyrias and which enzymes are associated with. And so we get uh, porphobilinogen acted on by porphobilinogen deaminase and uh, it's going to get converted into hydroxymethylbilane. Now from here on out you're going to see a whole bunch of these apostrophes. Anywhere there's apostrophe you can insert the, the phrase porphyrin. So 
for example, this would be uroporphyrinogen. So uroporphyrinogen is going to act on hydroxymethylbilane to produce uroporphyrinogen 3. Uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase is then going to act on that to produce a copro... I'm sorry, I needed a, an apostrophe here. It's coproporphyrinogen 3. And then uh, coproporphyrinogen oxidase will produce that, uh, convert that into protoporphyrinogen. And then the uh, protoporphyrinogen is acted on by protoporphyrinogen oxidase to produce protoporphyrin. Then the last step is ferrochelatase will add an iron to protoporphyrin to form heme. So that's the big picture from the microscope. And uh, what I want to do really quick is I'm going to write out all of the different enzymes, the nine enzymes, and uh, the mutations associated with each one. So the last one we said was in the liver and other tissues uh, other than the bone marrow. And the last one has no specific mutation, but it's associated with um, uh, exacerbations of acute hepatic porphyria. So I'm just going to put AHP. A last two is, uh, like I said, that this is a gene that's uh, known to be the cause of X-linked sideroblastic anemia, and it's also um, X-linked protoporphyria, XLP or XLPP. A lad has... Uh, uh, Problems with it are associated with amino levulinic acid uh, de uh, dehydratase pr uh, porphyria, so it's actually abbreviated ADP, amino levulinic acid dehydratase porphyria. Porphyrinogen deaminase is associated with acute intermittent porphyria. And I just want to pause right here. Uh, and make a mention because I watched a video on YouTube of a physician, a, a lady maybe in her late 30s that had been diagnosed with acute intermittent porphyria and she described it as presenting with the worst abdominal pain she has ever experienced. And uh, she, she described it that way because it's a neurogenic pain. It's not pain that is result from one of the abdominal viscera being irritated or or anything like that. It's uh, pain strictly from the nerves. And so when you have a worst abdominal pain of, of a person's life, you can't find any type of viscera associated or you can't find any imaging or any other type of studies that show a disease state, then you might want to put porphyria on your differential. Uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase is associated with congenital uh, erythropoietic porphyria, or CEP. And uroporphyrinogen uh, decarboxylase is associated with uh, two things. It's uh, porphyria cutanea tarda and uh, hepatoerythropoietic porphy uh, hepato porphyria, HEP. Coproporphyrinogen oxidase is associated with uh, hereditary coproporphyria, HCP. Protoporphyrinogen uh, oxidase is uh, associated with variegate porphyria, VP. And ferrochelatase is associated with uh, erythropoietic porphyria, EPP. Really quick note. XLPP is considered a subtype of EPP. Uh, it's a very rare subtype, not because of the enzyme, but because of the presentation, which we're going to see in a moment. Just as a quick side note, when we discussed how everything is done either in the cytosol or in the mitochondria, it's important to keep that in mind because uh, whenever you have, uh, for example, sideroblastic anemia, you are importing all kinds of iron into the mitochondria and these are in perinuclear mitochondria so mitochondria right around the nucleus and whenever the say for example the alas the sideroblastic anemia caused by mutation in alas you're not getting the the uh, 
protoporphyrin being created, it's not getting uh, imported back into the mitochondria and finish the biochemical pathway. So you have a buildup of this uh, mitochondrial iron, and whenever you stain that, uh, you'll get you'll see a ringed uh, sideroblast, and it's basically you see the nucleus and you see a ring of mitochondrial iron uh, deposits in the in the red blood cell. It's in the uh, the reticulocyte. Now, really quick, porphyria has uh, been classified two different ways. So the first way it's classified, I have listed here, is either acute or cutaneous. Uh, another way of classifying it is by its pathophysiology of where it occurs, either hepatic or in the bone marrow. So um, this is helpful uh, maybe in diagnosing a specific type of porphyria, but it's not helpful with the uh, clinical presentation. So looking at the clinical presentation, um, acute porphyrias are primarily nervous system. They also have visceral, so they're, they're sometimes called uh, neurovisceral, and so you get vomiting, abdominal pain, and neuropathy. Uh, uh, cutaneous porphyrias have two subtypes. Uh, you can either get blistering or non-blistering, but they both have skin involvement. Whenever the skin is exposed to sunlight, you get some type of uh, skin changes, and whether or not that's blistering or non-blistering depends on the subtype. So just to put those into perspective, we mentioned, like for example, acute intermittent porphyria, and the lady that said she had it said she had severe abdominal pain. So it's one of the neuroviscerals, and so there's four neuroviscerals. However, you got to keep in mind that these two are going to be classified as both neuroviscerals and cutaneous. So there are a couple of uh, of these presentations that are mixed between the uh, neurovisceral and the cutaneous. And so it's not a great classification scheme, but it works. Then we have the cutaneous por uh, porphyrias. And again, these are the same two that we saw on the last slide, the mixed ones. Uh, but then if you look here, we have blistering and we have non-blistering. So you can have... Uh, for example, porphyria cutanea tarda, which is going to be blistering, or we can have the X-linked porphyria, which is going to be uh, the X-linked protoporphyria, sorry, it's going to be non-blistering. It's also important to know with these non-blistering, whenever you get liver failure, you also get a neuropathy associated with these. The three most common types of porphyria are the uh, Porphyria cutanea tarda is the most common, acute intermittent porphyria, and the erythropoietic protoporphyria. And each of these types is a representative of all of the different subtypes. For example, the cutaneous blistering representative uh, porphyria cutanea tarda is representative of the other uh, types of cutaneous blistering. The acute intermittent porphyria is representative of all of the acute or neurovisceral porphyrias, and then the erythropoietic protoporphyria is representative, and there's only one other uh, non-blistering, and that's XLPP, and I said earlier that it was considered a subtype of the EPP, and it's a very, very extremely rare, but it's a su an extremely rare subtype of EPP because of how it presents. Last thing I have, it's not part of my objective, but I kept, uh, I've, I've mentioned in lab a few times how I have a chart that shows the sensitivity and specificity of different antibody tests for different diseases. And uh, so, for example, let's take systemic lupus erythematous and uh, sensitivity for double-stranded DNA is 70% and specificity 95%. That's a really good test. You're going to see on, on the next uh, slide, because there's a whole bunch more of these uh, diseases that I couldn't fit on here. On the next slide, you're going to see, well, I'll just go ahead and flip to it. Uh, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, they're tested together, and you don't get really better than a 30 to 50 percent uh, sensitivity, and I could not find information on specificity, but the PM1 antibody and the JO1 antibody are good for testing for these two things. This chart's in my study guide, so that's where you can find it.